Then I'm going to jump over to our next speaker, who has already been mentioned in this presentation, actually. This is from Holland, Bas Spitters. Uh, is coming up uh, on the floor now. He's from Department of Computer Science at Aarhus University, and uh, is going to be talking about smart contracts and formal verification from blockchain. So, uh, as Claudio said, so we just we recently set up a, a blockchain research center here with a generous grant from the uh, Concordium Foundation. And, and as part of this, we're doing formal verification and design of smart contract languages. So I will, I'd like to tell you a bit about this and uh, the motivation behind uh, doing this. Uh, so blockchains, so one of the basic things they provide, I mean, that there's a precise definition, so an, an append-only log that's unchangeable. But very importantly, what they provide is trust, trust in a system that because everyone can c participate in checking, um, we, we have security cryptography built in, so that those are very important aspects of the trust. But also understanding through open implementations, almost all the implementations of blockchains are, are open, uh, because if you have a closed implementation, people won't trust it, because they think you, will build a, you would build in a backdoor. Uh, scientific refereeing, that's an important process, and uh, mathematical proofs, so, so cryptographic proofs. So all those things contribute to having a whole system that people can actually trust. So currently, last, thing, uh, last time I checked, there were something like uh, 5,000 different cryptocurrencies. And I can tell you only uh, a handful of those are actually adhering to, to those principles, to all those principles. But uh, those are the principles we try for. We, we, we really want to make something that, that people can trust. Um, so, so why do we want to do formal verification? Claudio mentioned uh, very brief, briefly what it is. Uh, so giving a mathematical proof that are uh, um, giving a mathematical proof that our software actually satisfies a specification. So the internet broke uh, five years ago. And just to remind you about this, this heartbleed bug, so this was a, a bug in TLS. That's the protocol that's doing all the uh, communication on the internet. So TLS is basically, it's the lock on your, uh, in your internet browser. Um, what happened there is best explained by the XKCD webcomic, web and, and there are many things in life that are best explained by, uh, by this comic. Um, so so what, what happened there was, uh, in, in, the, in the protocol, was you would ask the server, uh, please give me back bird in four letters. And the, the, what the server would do was actually send you back this information. And now there's this strange thing in the protocol that you're both sending a string, a request, and you're sending the length of the request. So now Meg thinks, well, let, let's experiment a bit, and let's just ask for head with 500 letters. And then the, the server just obliges. So it looks up head and sends the 500 letters connected to that. And this allows you and anyone to read out this memory from the server. And, and this would contain uh, passwords, all kinds of private information, a master key. So the internet was really completely broken, and it was extremely hard to, uh, to fix this. And so, so this led to the realization that actually we need much better software uh, practices. Um, there, there are a number of standards for how good uh, software is. And there's one, one standard, the uh, EAL, um, which goes from 1 to 7 plus. Uh, so one is just you, you do very basic unit testing, and uh, the highest level you actually do formal verification, where you uh, prove that your software actually satisfy, meets its specification. Now, one of the things that that happens in TLS is we use these uh, uh, a cryptographic library. In in this case, uh, for example, elliptic curves. So elliptic curves, I gave you an artist impression here. In, in practice, what you're using is elliptic curves over finite fields, so you cannot actually draw the picture. So this is a, um, uh, one of the, the more advanced bachelor courses we're teaching here at Aarhus University. So what we need to do is to teach the computer to actually understand this mathematics that we're teaching our students. So it's quite advanced mathematics. And then we need to spell it out all the way down to the logical axioms, because we want to make sure that there are abs absolutely no mistakes in that process. Once we've done that, so this is already a quite complicated task, we only have the mathematical algorithm, but now we need to refine it to an efficient implementation. Um, 
So we also want to make sure, we want to have a formal proof that the compiler is actually correct. So this is, this is a lot of work, and we actually uh, want to extend the, uh, the work that's there. So there's, uh, Diego will be speaking after me, and we're looking for a PhD student to help us in that process. Um, so what the cryptographers are doing, they're, they're writing mathematical proofs, but writing proofs is hard, and, uh, and, and it's just a tedious task. So uh, people make uh, small mistakes in that. They're, they're off by one error. Um, and computers, as in any tedious, uh, tedious task, we can ask the computer to help us fill in these proofs. And there's now an emerging field of, of computer-aided cryptography where we combine uh, crypto, programming language research, and formal verification. So now to come back to the TLS story, uh, there's a lot of work uh, by, by a number of groups. I want to just highlight the, the work by Microsoft INRIA. They have a joint lab, and, and this joint lab was actually one of the examples also for the, uh, the Concordium uh, Center, where we have a collaboration between um, what's happening at the university and what's happening in the, in the company. So there's now a completely formal verification of the TLS protocol. Uh, there's a new standard, of course, because the old standard was broken. And if you're using Firefox or Chrome, you're actually using these formally verified libraries. So there's been a lot of progress in these five years. So the technology actually came, uh, became a lot better. This also means that if you get an accident, an accident like this in something that's as important as your banking software or, um, well, the internet in general, then you might also be liable for it because you haven't actually done the, uh, the rigorous process of making secure software. Um, so what they actually do is they prove the correctness of the CNS implementations of those libraries and uh, prove the security against a precise attacker model. So now, why am I mentioning this bug in TLS? Because there's something uh, very similar going on in the, the blockchain space. There we had enormous accidents. Uh, one very famous is this uh, distributed uh, funding organization. So the idea would be to have something like the, the industry fund, but then actually have it on the blockchain and have it fully done there. So, so people could make proposals and vote on proposals. And then if, if the majority of people thought, well, this is a good idea, then you would actually be uh, paid out. Uh, the problem was that the way this, this organization was pro uh, programmed, um, they thought they understood what they were doing, but the semantics of the underlying programming language was so subtle that actually the, the rules were slightly different. And in this way, they got hacked for half of the money they, uh, sorry, a third of the money they had for $50 million. Uh, so, and this is a program that's only about a thousand line of code. So it's very small. And still, there was such an enormous bug in it that actually allowed you to to empty out the whole uh, the whole organization if you want. Another one that that came up uh, or, or was published recently it it came up uh, about two years ago was a, a bug in a, a cryptographic uh, paper. So this was uh, is done by high quality researchers. It was it it went through scientific uh, review process. So so they've been extremely careful. Still, there was a, a, a very subtle bug in this, and this allowed you to print money. And uh, we hope it hasn't been exploited, but we cannot be sure. Um, so there's, there's a very, and, and all these things are things that, that we actually have the technology to avoid by doing formal verification. Uh, so what we want to have is a blockchain with the quality of TLS, or maybe even better. Uh, so you saw this, uh, this picture before. So this is what the, the blockchain spec, uh, stack actually looks like. And we're doing verification of the whole stack. So I want to highlight one thing that uh, actually my uh, PhD student, Cern Alan Thompson, is, is working on. So this is the verification of the uh, consensus protocol. And we now have a proof that the Concordium consensus pro protocol is actually functionally correct. The, the next thing what we want to do is to prove that it's also secure. And there we need to do, uh, as I showed you before, what we're doing here is reducing everything to the, uh, the ordinary logic. But because of this uh, cryptographic, uh, cryptographic aspects, there are all kinds of new reasoning principles that come in. So this is reasoning about probabilities, reasoning about an attacker. And so we need to have a very precise attacker model and reasoning about distributed systems. 
So there are all kinds of new reasoning principles that come in. So there's a lot of work to be done there. Fortunately, um, we, we have some things to, to start out with. Then I want to switch or, or continue with smart contracts. Claudia already highlighted this. Um, so the first generation of blockchains, so we can say this is, uh, this is Bitcoin, which is purely a cryptocurrency. The second generation was the realization that the underlying technology of Bitcoin is actually the blockchain, and we can just put a general purpose uh, programming language on top of this, and these are then called smart contracts. Uh, so a smart contract is the, the dig digital analog of a legal contract. So one example is here where you can insure your house on the, on the blockchain. So if your house burned down, you automatically get paid out. Uh, here's some, uh, some similarities and some differences between ordinary contracts and smart contracts. So the specification of an ordinary contract would be in uh, natural language and legalese. A smart contract it would just be code. Identity and consent would be a signature or a digital signature. Dispute resolution would be judges. And it, for a smart contract, this could be done on a, in a decentralized uh, matter. A nullification is done by judges. Uh, perhaps it could be done on the uh, blockchain with governance. And payment and ESCO are just built in into the, uh, the blockchain. Uh, potential applications of, of smart contracts are uh, making new, new tokens. So we don't really need to design a new blockchain each time we want to build a new cryptocurrency. We can just implement the token on, on the blockchain. Uh, voting, uh, escrow, marketplaces, insurance, uh, supply chain management. There, there are a number of examples there. And also uh, replacement for DNS. That's something that's actually in use. So what's, what's happening now? Because, uh, so, so this uh, DAO example, so this is a very, uh, very critical example that just shows that it's extremely hard to write such contracts in um, basically JavaScript. So that's JavaScript is the programming language they, they uh, used for Ethereum. And then you just make uh, mistakes and these mistakes can be avoided by using a more uh, mature, more modern programming language. Um, so a lot of projects, uh, uh, the Tezos project, Cardano project, the Concordium project, uh, Zilliqa project, they're all moving towards a new uh, programming language. Uh, typically those would be functional programming languages. And there, those are uh, much easier to understand, much easier to reason about, much easier to analyze. So you could, for instance, uh, compute how much gas you actually need to run a, uh, such a contract as opposed to just paying it. Um, and they have a very clear meaning. So you can actually, it's actually much easier to understand what you're doing. And so in this way you can avoid, um, can avoid big accidents like this. Uh, there's a, there are a number of very simple uh, in, invariants you could have written down for this, uh, this distributed organization. If you would have just proved those, the 50 million would still be there. So what we're building uh, in my group is a, a verification framework for these smart contracts. And this is both looking at the, uh, at the compilers, the interpreters for smart contracts, looking at verifying um, individual contracts. So we now have a re-implementation of the uh, DAO in the, uh, in the Oak language, and we're proving properties about it. And in this way, you can make sure that uh, a, a very big class of accidents uh, doesn't happen. So uh, th th this was just a wrap up of some of the, uh, the things, some of the research we have going on in the, uh, the Concordium Blockchain Center. And uh, I'd like to, to emphasize some of the tools we're using. So this is computer-aided cryptography and modern smart contract language design. So we're taking a lot of ideas from uh, programming languages. And what is very important is that we have a very clear meaning, very clear semantics, and, and languages that are easy to analyze. Thank you. Only for my own benefit here. Yes. Uh, depending on the audience, who in this audience feel that you can explain the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum? 
to your little bit slow aunt at a family dinner? Who hands up? Who can? Who feel that they can do this? Okay, you get to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody <laughs> dares. You knew I was going to pick you. No, please. So, so as I tried to say, so so Bitcoin is just uh, it's just money, whereas Ethereum allows you to have so you have a, a big ledger, and uh, then you can write any contract uh, that you would write down uh, with the help of your lawyer on top of that blockchain, and then you could carry it out uh, as as just a programming language. So it's really the difference between money and a world computer as the way it's, it's marketing. So it's a, a very big uh, difference in, in functionality. And you could use Ethereum to um, write contracts for other coins, for instance. So there, there are currently many coins running on top of Ethereum. I think you have a really super smart ant. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to actually probe a little bit more into this. Can you use some examples of the difference here? What different yes. applications would you have? Uh, I had a lift, list on the... Uh, uh, on, on the slide. So um, you, you could have an insurance for to, to have nice weather today. So you would have, um, you, you would write a contract saying, well, if the weather is good uh, today, then I, uh, if, the, if the weather is bad today, then I actually get paid uh, an amount of money. So this is a very simple example. Um, another one would be um, uh, the, the uh, name coin that I mentioned. So this is a replacement for uh, DNS. DNS is just uh, the connection between the URL you have in your browser and the IP address. And so this is basically some public log where you just connect names to addresses. So this is a very typical application that you can write on the blockchain. This is not something you can write in Bitcoin because there's no programming language there, but this is something you can easily write in a smart contract language. It's, it's 10 lines of code basically. So that's, that's a very simple example, but that's one that's actually in use. And if some great article comes to mind that you think that I should know of, that we could share on social media for people who are trying to understand the subject, please send it to me, and I'll make sure it gets uh, out uh, to, to the network that I have. Because I think this is important that people actually try to understand this, and that's also why it's a trend session for us today. Yeah. So thank you very much to Bas. Thank you. Very thank much. you.